Sure. Thanks for everyone for coming today. Um, uh, I, I, my name is Evan Schwimmer. I am a full-time uh, MBA graduate from 2010. I'm going to introduce my panelists here in a moment, but, but before I do that, I've got a couple of public service announcements. Uh, for those of you that are in the real estate industry, I am very happy to announce that uh, the Haas team beat the Stanford team at the Golden Shovel competition this week. Yeah. Big round of applause. Go Bears. Um, also, uh, I want to announce the grand uh, relaunch of the Berkeley Real Estate Alumni Association, of BREA for short. Um, the BREA organization had a relaunch event at Salesforce Tower this, thurs or this last Thursday. Really great. Uh, spent some time with Heinz and Paul Parity, the developer, um, explaining everything that went into the history of the, of the project. Uh, great, great event. Uh, looking forward to a lot more of them. Looking forward to strengthening the Haas alumni network with a real estate specific focus. Um, we are really uh, concentrated in the Bay Area now, but uh, looking to expand that network and to strengthen that network throughout the country uh, soon to come. For those of you that are interested in learning more about real estate or the real estate uh, alumni network um, with the real estate focus, go to berkeleyrealestate.org. Um, register and we'll, you'll start to get some, some more information. We've got some more events on the calendar and looking forward to it. Um, so with that, I'm going to introduce my, my panelists here. Uh, the, uh, to my left, Jason Dries Daphner to, at the end. Um, Jason is the Director of Operations for the San Francisco Office of Perkins and Will, a licensed architect with more than 20 years of experience. He has a Master's of Architecture degree from Cal, and he's completed projects in North America, Central America, and Asia. Jason's experience managing complex commercial and hospitality projects enables him to work effectively with multiple or multi-stakeholder teams to drive business results and deliver on client goals. Uh, in the middle is Nav uh, Ar Athwal. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah, you got it. Perfect. Founder and CEO of Realty Shares uh, for over four years. Nav is a pioneer in real estate technology. He has over a decade of experience in real estate as an attorney, broker, and investor. Nav lectures at UC Berkeley Law School and the Haas School of Business. He is a frequent contributor to Forbes and is often featured on CNBC, Bloomberg, and Fox Business. He holds a JD from UC Berkeley Law School, where he was the class valedictorian. Uh, Lori, Laura, Laura Billings, to Nav's left, is a founding principal of Oryx Partners and leads the firm's development and management activities. She has over 15 years of experience in all facets, facets of real estate development, including acquisitions, due diligence, leasing, marketing, financing, entitlements, and project construction management. Prior to joining and co-founding Oryx Partners, uh, Laura founded Sage Green Development in 2008, a real estate and green building consulting firm. Laura holds her MBA with a certificate in real estate from Haas, along with an undergraduate expertise in urban planning. Laura worked in community development banking and municipal housing bond finance prior to earning her MBA. And finally, to my left, Michael Yarney. Michael is a co-founder of Social Construct, having joined the company in January of 2018 after transitioning out of a partnership with Build Inc. Social Con Construct, which I'm sure we'll hear more about as we uh, move through this panel, is a VC-backed construction tech startup developing a mini modular system of multifamily housing that targets reduction of hard costs by half. Prior to build, Michael served as a policy advisor to San Francisco mayors Newsom and Lee, securing the approval of the $7 billion Park Merced development. He has also practiced land use and real estate law at Farella, Braun, and Martel, and currently teaches a land use law and economics course in the undergraduate program of the UC Berkeley's College of Environmental Design. Michael has served on the boards of several innovative Bay Area nonprofit organizations, including Place Lab and City Car Share. Michael received his JD and Masters and Masters in City Planning degrees from UC Berkeley. Everybody, uh, thank you very much for, for joining us today. And to get us started, what I thought I'd do is just uh, read a, a, an excerpt from a recent report, or relatively recent report, put out by McKinsey Global Institute that really speaks to the construction industry's productivity problem and how that relates back to the real estate industry at large. Globally, labor, labor productivity growth in construction has averaged only 1% per year over the past two decades, 
compared with growth of 2.8% for the total world economy and 3.6% in the case of manufacturing. If the construction sector productivity were to catch up with that of the total economy, it, and it can, this would boost the sector's value added by an estimated $1.6 trillion, adding about 2% to the global economy, or the equivalent of meeting about half of the world's infrastructure needs. One third of that opportunity is in the United States. So with that, I'm gonna open it up to the panel uh, with my first question. What are some trends in real estate and technology that you all think will shape the real estate industry over the next five to 10 years? Nav, you want to take it? You want to you want to start well, that disruption, off? Disruption, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Just uh, <laughs> cited some statistics. Um, you know, I, I think real estate's this very broad. Oh, yeah. This, this, uh, you can take it out. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yes, please. This is what happens when you try grabbing coffee and water at the same time. <laughs> can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, so, you know, my background in real estate is more from the lending capital market side. Um, you know, construction is something I've observed from the sidelines. So I, I'll let the experts in construction talk about that trend. You know, I think one one is we are seeing some level of adoption of technology within real estate. It's slow going. The industry is sort of built. There's a wall that's built that keeps technology out that I think is slowly starting to be broken down. But just from running in realty shares for the last four or five years, what I've noticed is if uh, elements of the transaction, the real estate transaction, whether it's mortgage or purchase and sale, property management, that have historically been done in an analog offline uh, manner are starting to be digital. Um, and there's a lot more adoption now, especially as you have uh, capital from investors, venture capitalists, that comes from strategic. So if you think about the historical venture capital industry, which is a bunch of Sand Hill Road uh, investors, they don't really understand how the real estate markets work and how to kind of create efficiency with technology. But as you get more strategic investors and some funds have even introduced major real estate funds as LPs, I think you are starting to get a better understanding of how the transaction process, which is what we focused on at Realty Shares, can be made much more efficient through technology. Um, and technology that actually is not that complex. We're not talking about you know, machine learning, predictive analytics, which I think is the next stage. We're just talking taking processes like signing legal documents, data rooms that would uh, exist in the offline world, and transitioning them online. So I think the transaction piece, at least for me, is one area where I'm seeing a lot more innovation. And I think with new technologies like blockchain, um, et cetera, over the next five to 10 years, we'll see that get more and more efficient, which means you know, co uh, costs will be brought down and you'll see things that were happening, again, in the offline world in a very analog, costly manner happening in a much more digital manner. Michael, in terms of your perspective and you're in the construction side, uh, what, what are your thoughts on the opportunities going forward? Uh, yeah, I'm, I, I want to start by saying I'm not an expert in construction, but I am now a co-founder of a construction tech company, so it's sort of interesting. Um, what I am an expert in, I guess, is recognizing what the biggest structural problem is in our sector, and it is construction costs. Um, so we could have a, an incredibly efficient capital market sector, and we could even have finally in California some serious land use reform. Um, uh, one, ho one hopes abolishing CEQA from urban areas and uh, um, passing Senator Wiener's SB 827 and um, all the other good stuff he's cooking up. You could do that, um, but for those of us who are recover, I'm a recovering developer. I know I have another developer on the panel. Um, land is only about 10 to 11 percent of project costs usually. Um, you, can, you can have a few exceptions, and soft costs uh, are increasingly. Um, also not the big driver. It is the 8,000-pound the 8, 8, gorilla is construction costs. And the construction cost monster, as I like to call it, is killing deals everywhere. Um, and people haven't felt it yet um, because there's a lot of cranes still up in the sky from the last set of GMPs that were uh, um, guaranteed maximum price contracts that were um, put in place maybe a couple of years ago. But uh, the Bay Area is about to hit a wall. And uh, I, I, it, this doesn't affect commercial as much as it affects um, residential and specifically multifamily. Our business is laser focused on how do you make market, ba market um, uh, for profit multifamily affordable to the middle class. And 
Speaking of uh, reform and, and, and further innovations, turning it a little bit back to the design and, and um, planning side of the equation in real estate, Laura, maybe you can speak to the, the sustainability piece and the opportunities that are, sure. that are out there. Sure. So I'm here speaking today on the green building side. And when I'm speaking about it, just for context, I'm really talking about um, – the movement that started back in 2002, 2003 with the United States Green Building Council when it took a bunch of disparate industries that been around for a long time in indoor air quality, in um, energy and water efficiency, and in materials and resources, uh, sustainable site use, and brought them all together in a codified system called LEED. And um, so I'm talking kind of about the green building movement in that context. And um, when you talk about productivity and efficiency in real estate from a green building perspective, then this would be even the piece that comes after <laughs> the inefficiency of the construction and then the financing. And then once you get into the building, green buildings really looking at it from the productivity and efficiency of the experience of the employees from the perspective of the occupants of that building. And um, one of the great things the green building movement has done is to point out, and it, first of all, to be able to speak in the terms of the folks they're trying to convince, right? And a lot of environmental movements had people saying, you know, we got to do these things because the polar bears are dying and the rivers are polluted. Here it said, look, you know what? Um, labor costs, and you look at your bar chart of cost as a company in a space, you know, here's rent, here's your utility bills, here's labor, right? So if you can make a 1% uh, shift in your productivity, um, you have massively dwarfed um, even just the entire cost of your utilities alone in that 1% shift. And guess what? Um, people turn out they really prefer to work in a space with uh, a good indoor air quality, fresh air, access to operable windows, daylight views. Um, they, you, if you do these things, people want to come work at your company more than other competitors. They want to stay longer, and you can track productivity in terms of um, reduced sick days, reduced absenteeism, um, better employee retention, lower turnover. And so you can. There is data to track it. It's a little squishy, but again, there are reports that establish, you know, 10, 12 percent improvements in those metrics. So even if you're talking about that one percent, if you can improve that productivity and efficiency of people on that space by one percent, people say, you know. I get it. Okay, you know, you're speaking in, in my terms, and you can still put that in terms of a return on cost, or return on investment, and you can show that the cost of the green building improvements um, on a percentage basis are very minor compared to the benefits that company will achieve. So that's what the U.S. Green Building Council did such a great job of, and it was um, quite innovative 15 years ago. We can talk about that in a little bit of kind of where, you know, is green building still innovative, and if so, you know, where it's going. But that's... Um, I think green building's role in this conversation about productivity and efficiency. Jason, I think as an architect, you have a, um, amongst the panelists here, you've got a more unique opportunity to really see the projects from start to finish, the full life cycle and across all aspects of a project. Yeah. From your perspective, where do you see the opportunities? Um, I think, you know, it's coincidentally, with Michael Nav and Laura, that that is where the opportunity is, from my point of view, just someone in the real estate industry as well as specifically being an architect. Uh, I remember, it, it's 2018, so 23 years ago, 24 years ago, I was sitting in the courtyard in Worcester Hall. So besides Michael, any other CED alum here? Yes, all right, hi. Um, <laughs> so I was sitting in the courtyard in Worcester Hall and I was reading I think independently, but it was an article about mass customization in the construction industry. And at the time, people were doing things like that. You know, maybe 10 years before, Norman Foster had done these prefab toilets that uh, plugged into the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank. So it wasn't a unique idea. It just wasn't in common use. So now in 2018, I can sit next to Michael, and he's doing uh, micro prefabrication. So, so to see that come into the industry is great. Or what, what NAV is doing, which is freeing up capital, and making a certain amount of liquidity available or moving, let's say, a relatively freer flow of capital among people and among marketplaces, that's huge. And, you know, what Laura is saying is from the green building perspective, I can remember in, you know, 96, 97, 98, a lot of these ideas, if not radical, they weren't warmly embraced. And now, you know, we're all sitting in a building that's lead platinum. Mm -hmm. And that's just, it's almost to be expected. It's a cool thing. But it's standard. It's no longer a, a, a marketing angle. It was probably, and I'm guessing, 
10, 11 years ago that at some point the upgrade in terms of financial investment for developers from Lead Silver to Lead Gold was ultimately a wash. Like if, if you were in, if you turned on the switch to go from here to here, you were in. So then it was a much easier conversation topic to have with developers. So now we've moved on, as Laura said, to different types of certification like well. So she mentioned you know, places with access to natural light, fresh air, views, which seem a little bit commonsensical, right? But the industry in which I'm associated moved us a little bit further away. But, you know, like there are operable windows where we can have natural light and air and a reasonably decent view of some nice redwood trees. So it's, it's nice to see that come full circle. For me, ultimately, what the three other panelists are doing, if, if we think of it as a larger system, is they are uh, removing obstructions to the free flow whether it's the free flow of labor and training of labor or the free flow of capital or just the free flow of you know, health and well-being of our citizens, that's where the innovations are going to come from. And they're making the whole system operate that, that much more efficiently and smoothly. Um, so hopefully that answers some of the question. Yeah, that's great. I think uh, I mean, things that you are, I think are all talking about, Laura, you alluded to it. Jason, I think you talked about it in uh, a very, very in a very focused way. Um, there's a lot of elements within the industry that – uh, we've been adopting over time and have been innovative in the past and now be have become commonplace and a bit of the status quo. How do you guys see the industry moving from here now that lead is sort of the standard, well is the new, but when well becomes the standard, what, what comes after that? And, that? and whether or not that's uh, from a, a sustainable design perspective or uh, you know, crowdsource funding, once that becomes the norm and what, you know, what comes after that? Give it a shot. Sure, sure. So I can talk a little bit about, again, this arc. You know, the, the, the goal USGBC set out 15 years ago plus, 17, 18 years ago when they were starting, is to transform the the uh, the built environment with regard to green building. And in California, I mean, that's really happened. So LEED is the basis of Cal Green. Cal Green was out, is now statewide building code, so it's mandatory for all construction across the state. And it was built on LEED. And so the, the interesting thing is that USGBC has achieved its goal and then almost put themselves out of business in a sense, is that if your code keeps getting greener and greener, then why do you want to pay anywhere from fifty dollars to $100,000 more to pay consultants and fees and go through a pretty challenging and rigorous process to get the third-party certification? So it's going through a, an interesting transformation. Now, you can also look back nationally and say that California is the only state so far that's um, – baked lead into its building codes, others are looking to follow, and you still look at the number of new buildings built um, across the country, lead certified or Greenpoint rated certified buildings are still a small percent. So there's still a long way. To, I don't want to make it sound like check, we're done, because again, sitting here in California, it looks one bay way, but looking across the country, it's it's very different. But I think, you know, lead, USGBC is ratcheting up. They always wanted to be, you know, uh, achievable for the top 25 to 30 percent of the industry. So they're, they're ratcheting it up, but trying to figure out a way to still streamline their process, because um, they have suffered from uh, complexity and difficulty and cost, uh, but then there's these other certification programs coming up um, focusing on, you know, going further, regen regenerative design. How do you produce, uh, how does a building produce more energy than it uses? Um, how do you leave cleaner water? How do you um, actually have a regenerative design? And well, which takes the efficiency and productivity and experience of the occupant to a whole new level. They're talking about, you know, the, the scorecard criteria include mind. You know, how do you create spaces for folks to have breaks and, and, and meditation and ability to can recharge your mind, fitness, um, a whole nother level of indoor air quality and, and actually testing performance, not just a scorecard of how is it designed, how is it performed? I don't care how it's designed. If it's, you know, if it's not performing, it really doesn't matter. And you basically waste a lot of money. So focusing on really performance and outcomes um, and uh, so they and keep staying a step beyond code and continuing to push the industry, but I think as Michael can talk about, then there's another dilemma of what happens if our codes become, have so many expensive elements baked in that our construction industry hasn't caught up to be able to do those efficiently. efficiently. Like what are you layering on on the uh, construction costs in the industry? Uh, Laura, I really appreciate the pass off because I was actually <laughs> going to say yeah. um, that all sounds great and, I, and it's funny because I don't own a car and um, I've been very involved in environmental causes my whole life. 
And one of the things I worry about is I call it the Mill Valley effect, um, where um, um, there is a small number of people who have everything super green and their housing is the most expensive in the, in the country. And they feel righteous and good, but um, the vast majority of people are not benefiting. And we're seeing this in California. This is the most expensive state to build in, period. Um, the Wharton, um, uh, a competitor institution, but the uh, Wharton Land Use Regulatory Index, if you folks don't know it, is a fantastic effort by um, Wharton Business School to quantify the complexity and density of regulations affecting uh, development. And they've tried to uh, regularize this. Um, this state is off the chart, and that, that index directly correlates to the affordable housing crisis, directly. There's just, it, it's not even uh, debatable at this point among serious economists. And so the question is, this, I'm not somebody here to say, throw the regulations out the window, uh, no. But um, what I'm very worried about is um, the, the state has had a tendency, particularly in San Francisco particularly, to pile on uh, well-intentioned and good-sounding regulations with absolutely no regard for the cost benefit and for the cost trade-off. And we are being crushed as a regional economy by the inability of the market to provide middle-income housing. If we continue this way, this region will suffer. And it will become a region of the super rich and the very poor. And that is not healthy socially, certainly not healthy politically, and I would argue economically it's not a recipe for success. So that is not to say, throw out the green building code regulations, it's to say the only way we're going to be able to make sure that um, we are successful is that we make California affordable. The number of companies I'm hearing in the last six months that are relocating to Austin, they're going to red Texas because housing is cheap. Um, and this is a serious problem. We can feel great in California about our really rigorous codes, but does it matter if the majority of people are relocating to states uh, where they have none of those codes, uh, that have much higher VMT, vehicle miles traveled, excuse me, have much higher greenhouse gas emissions per capita? Um, we, I worry about that. Um, um, you know, uh, grill, building a lead platinum building in a, in a sprawl context is going to offset all of that benefit almost immediately. Um, by the way, if people having to commute from the Central Valley, middle class people, to work a decent college educated job in the, in the Silicon Valley is not only inhumane, it is totally unsustainable. So I'm obviously on my soapbox here. Um, the reason I am is I, I remain optimistic, but I think that the state's going to have to be very creative about reforming its building code, for one thing, to allow the kind of innovation where there is a lot to be saved. I would so much rather spend, in fact, our system essentially, our system at Social Construct is doing the classic play. We're capitalizing labor. Our goal is to reduce labor expense by about 70%. And interestingly, our system, the product, the material costs will actually go up. Why is that a great thing? Because our, the apartments that we are going to help build uh, will last longer, be of higher material quality. And for those of you that are familiar with OPEX, should have a lower operating uh, cost, which has a huge back benefit um, for folks underwriting apartment projects. But we're, all, we're focused on the front end, first and foremost, on bringing those costs down. And if we can bring labor down, which is the big beast, um, we can afford uh, to do platinum. <laughs> um, and we can afford to do green roofs. And we can afford to do a lot of other really societal, socially and environmentally beneficial things. But I, I feel if the state uh, and the industry it doesn't get serious about cost control, all of those lovely things will be um, almost boutique, mm -hmm. as in um, you know, the blue coasts, mm -hmm. really. Um, not to make a joke of it. And there's no reason that that should be the case. Um, so uh, you might ask, well, then where, where do you go from here? Um, our approach is uh, there's a lot of great innovation finally happening in construction. Um, uh, we'll see how it all sorts out. I'm sure everyone's heard about Katera, a um, uh, billion dollars. Um, we'll see what they do with a billion dollars. I think a lot of us are going, wow, sometimes you can have too much money. but. Um, their, their, you know, their play is uh, full vertical integration. There's, a, there, there's a, there's a, a uh, an argument that um, by controlling the entire supply chain from land acquisition through occupancy, there could be efficiencies. Uh, we don't know. Katera is very um, protective of what they're doing. It's not clear how they're going to achieve those efficiencies. There are what I call the big box prefab companies, which are I don't mean big box in a pejorative meaning. I mean they they literally build big boxes. 
that would be uh, 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 um, Factory OS um, and uh, Rad Urban are the two local or Northern California operations. There are others. In that case, they're moving pieces of, they're all focused on housing, uh, multifamily mainly. Um, the idea is to get factory efficiency. So they're literally building in a factory setting um, uh, components, large pieces of apartment buildings that then are reassembled on, on site. Uh, our company is taking a very different approach. Um, we are doing what we are, for lack of a better word, I sometimes call micro-module, micro-prefab or micro-modular. Micro we're developing, essential, we're IKEA-fying um, the interiors of buildings. So we're not taking the structure on and we're not taking the skin. We're developing a kit of standardized parts, uh, almost like Legos. Um, and it, we're turning the MEP into a plug and play system. We're pick, taking it entirely out of the walls. Uh, and we are digitizing and measuring every single piece of the building. Um, there's a software component to this, which I don't have time to explain, but architects would be able to tell real time as they're doing conceptual designs exactly how many parts uh, each unit requires. And if we're successful, literally the number of labor hours. Um, if any of you are coming from development, you'd probably fall off your chair if you could ever get something like that. Because the way we usually receive it is a bid that is about as opaque as uh, mm -hmm. this blue jacket. You just, you're told it's, oh yeah, it's gonna be $40,000 for electrical per unit. And you're like, uh, is that the materials? Is that the labor? No, just you know, 40,000. You know, we're in a sector where there's no transparency. So a part of our system as well, besides standard micro standardization, not macro, micro, is um, very rigorously, obsessively documenting how much time it takes to install all the pieces. Uh, and we're hoarding data um, and then deploying it. I was going to say. Um I'm sure Michael, he knows this, and actually Michael back there in the audience might be interested, and he's got some things, the Internet of Things that might be coming up and ask you some questions later. So what you're talking about when we're sitting in the design studio and we're looking at things like parametric design and computational design mm -hmm. is as we are, I'm going to use the verb drawing, it's not literally drawing, in fact it's modeling using the computer, we're not just looking at, at let's say, visible lines and volumes, but all of these things have data attached to them. So if we were looking at Michael's system, then we would, in the design phase, be looking at these things as well. Say, oh, if we have five in this configuration, how does that compare to five in that configuration? And then we're starting to look at that data as part of the design feedback loop and helping us understand, oh, no, 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 our client really said that they want to emphasize you know, a certain aspect, so let's make sure we're moving in this direction. And then we might be getting feedback from the manufacturer or the, you know, the, the proprietor of the system. So what Mike is describing, generally speaking, we're doing kind of on a day-to-day -day basis. It's just layering on lots more information. And then hopefully the responsible designers are taking that information and doing something that something with that. So we're, we've got a study, one of our towers going up in Oakland. There was a computational design study just looking at the type of shading on the uh, different exterior faces, you know, depending on its orientation. So this is nothing new in the architectural real estate world, but it's an example where we were plugging in different configurations of uh, glazing size and shading devices and very quickly getting a lot of feedback about what was going to be the most efficient in terms of human comfort on the, inter on the interior of the space. So we're, we're seeing a lot of what you're talking about in a, in a really positive way. So I want to go back to something that, Michael, you also said, and that's the role of government in this industry. The government, both at federal, state, local levels, historically has had and continues to have a heavy regulatory hand, whether or not it's in the, uh, the entitlements, the permitting, or the financial element um, of, the, uh, you know, of, the, of the full process. Uh, is the government a friend, a foe, or, or both? And if so... One of those three is it? Uh, you know, what are you doing about it? Uh, how do you how do you approach that issue? And then you also spoke to. And I think this. Um, I think uh, any one of you can can uh, respond to this as well. Uh, the technologies that you're proposing uh, and and working on, they seem to be at least here for the case of the Bay Area, particularly acutely needed, where you also have the the heaviest regulatory component. So how how do you how do you navigate that? Where are you deploying your technology? Where is it if it's not in the Bay Area, where else in the country? Now I have some similar question. Are you taking 
um, uh, realty shares or, or advising realty shares to take their platform overseas? You're already there, and how are you responding? I think the the quickest answer is the government's very reactive. Um, <laughs> so I, we our our government regulation came at the federal level more so than at the local level. I think the benefit you have at the local level, um, depending on the type of technology you're developing, is you're very close to the customer, right? So you're able to influence local politics and local government just because you're infiltrating a local market, you're getting a lot of adoption, think Uber, think Airbnb, you bring building a lot of political capital, and you're able to influence uh, the decision makers. At the federal government, you're very disconnected from uh, the, the the political body or the decision makers are very disconnected from the constituency, um, especially if your your business is impacting a specific market. So what I found is that the federal government, where we were heavily regulated by the SEC, FINRA, et cetera, it's very, very reactive, very understaffed. So they try to react to, de to development that's already maybe a year or two in the making. And at most of the time, they don't know what to do with it. Um, and they kind of rack their brain. They probably spend a lot of taxpayer money trying to figure it out, only to come back with a subpar solution. That then, So I don't, the best way we've found to influence that is to be a part of the conversation as much as we can. And sometimes that's doable, and sometimes it's, 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 it's impossible. Um, so at the local government level, I'm sure um, others have something to say, but I, I think that is how we've felt about the federal government. The one other thing I wanted to add about technology adoption generally is um, you know, over the last five years running Realty Shares, what I've, and, and is also being a part of other company pitches, what it comes down to is adoption and what we'll see over the next five to 10, ten years is driven by the bottom line. So any pitch you go to, any technology you're trying to sell, ultimately it all comes down to how's this going to save me money today or, or in a year or two years. And, and I think uh, you know some savvy customers will see that even though it may be more expensive over the near term, it's going to be a lot cheaper uh, to do business in a year or two years. Others will see trends that are happening in front of their face. You know. Who would have know, known Amazon was going to buy Whole Foods and get in the grocery business? And so they, they're a little bit more and, – and, and what I've seen, which is positive in my opinion, is large companies actually building in-house technology research teams saying, figure out which technologies apply to us. And even if that means giving them a little bit of money, because we don't expect to make a ton of return on our money, but just giving them a little bit of money so we are – in the conversation, that's worth it. Um, so I think that's a positive. And so what will reshape the future of technology in real estate, I think, is based on how does it translate to into better, bigger profits, which sounds very capitalistic, but it's true. And sitting in Berkeley, it sounds horrible, but it's true. And I think it's based on just experience and knowing that, you know, there's people love nice things and doing good if they're also making money. I love that we have to apologize for saying capitalism in Berkeley. It cracks me up. I, um, as I see one of my students is here from uh, uh, the class I teach uh, at, actually at CED, College of Environmental Design, and I'm unabashedly uh, uh, pro-market. I actually start my class by talking about the metaphor. I say the market is a river. It's amoral. It's not immoral. It doesn't care about you. Um, you can learn how the water flows uh, and channel it to really productive ends, or you can scream at it and then jump in it and drown and then blame it, but you know, <laughs> it doesn't care. Um, and um, and I, I find that that sort of Buddhist um, um, uh, analogy sometimes breaks through, um, and, I, and I, I apply that to our business. Uh, the market is a river. We need to figure out how to harness it um, in a positive um, values-based way. So I don't see, I'm a values-based capitalist. <laughs> uh, that being said, um, government, so funny, grass is always greener now because I'm thinking, oh, God, it would be so great to be regulated by the state or the, or the federal <laughs> government. Sure. I have no influence locally. It, the local government is insane. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, I mean, I'm speaking about San Francisco, so perhaps uh, sure. But uh, I, I'm sure I see uh, Laura nodding, nodding vigorously. <laughs> okay, so I, I, there's a story that developers run the show, but in my experience, and I'm speaking to San Francisco, that is not the case. Um, so it's funny. It's, it's an interesting thing. Be careful what you ask for. Um, that being said, um, on a very positive note, um, my philosophy is that if government recognizes the extent of the affordable housing crisis, um, the best thing they can do right now is to get out of the way and facilitate creative um, pilot projects. Pilot, I'll emphasize, pilot projects. So I'm not suggesting, and I think government plays an incredibly important role, 
Uh, you know, the classic economics argument is um, government should intervene when there's market failure. I'm a, I'm a firm believer of that. There are collective goods that, by definition, private individual entities can't provide. Um, great. Um, they're called public goods. Um, we talk about that in my class. Um, however, there are many areas where the private sector can be very creative, uh, can take risks that government can't. And my concern is that um, there's, a, at times, a tendency to regulate first and ask questions later. Uh, it's react reactive. Um, uh, in our case, um, and this is actually kind of almost like a form of therapy, um, uh, post-San Francisco therapy, um, we're, um, as part of our um, scaling for our, our technology, we're developing a very small apartment project, ground up. Uh, we call it Small Town. Um, it'll be an LLC. Um, we're going to raise a small bit of L traditional real estate LP money. Um, it's a six-unit building. I've never done a I've, my, Our buildings my old firm worked on were 120 units or greater. So we're doing this very small project. And the reason it's so novel, and I'm bringing this up in response to your comment, is instead of buying the land and then dealing with the local government, we're actually dating. I call it we're speed dating local governments right now, um, going around the Bay Area. And I'm doing interviews and getting to know the staffs. And we're going to pick a city that what I'll call is an aspirational local government. Mm. And I, I'm just going to do a shout out for one of my favorite. It's not physically my favorite city, but it is, has the best attitude, which is the city of Fremont. Mm. is amazing. Mm. Speaking about their local government, it's an attitude. There's a, it, you can go really far with a positive attitude. I call it a partnership attitude, mm -hmm. where the local government sees the developer slash a tech company as a innovator partner, not as something to be regulated. Mm -hmm. I'm not suggesting that they also don't have an obligation to the public to regulate. I, I want to make a really clear distinction. Local government needs to enforce life safety, uh, health and life safety. Th this, but there is a way you can do that that is performance-based, that allows innovation, and there's a way you can do that that is heavy-handed, uh, we've never done it that way. That's, I don't see that in the California Building Code. Sorry, not going to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. So I'm optimistic um, because we're able to do this local government speed dating <laughs> that we're going to find the right match, and then we're going to actually, after we find the right government, we're going to buy property in that city, and we're going to do our first ground up. Cool. Um, and the reason we need to do that is our, our approach to interiors and MEP, we f feel is completely fully compliant with the spirit of the California Building Code in terms of performance-based health, life, safety. But we know that it doesn't conform with the letter. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to be needing to get what's called an equivalency, a series of equivalencies. And we need to be with a local government that's imaginative and proactive. Mm, that's interesting. That is the kind of government I think that all of us who are in this sector love working with. Mm -hmm. And that kind of government can be a partner. So that's, what we're, mm -hmm. that's how we're trying to solve that, mm -hmm. that, that problem. Um, kind of uh, to, the, to the question of government friend or foe for green building movement, uh, it's largely been friend. Um, and um, we were talking before the panel started about how real estate developers were by far the um, latest adopter of the green building. But I would say, and rightly so, because the real estate development industry is so fraught with complexity, multiple forms and layers of risk, um, extreme costs that nobody around them understands or appreciates, uh, that you're asking somebody to say, take on this brand new um, uh, lead scorecard and start implementing it, and we can't really tell you exactly yet what it costs or the hiccups and bumps in the road that need to be worked out, they're going to say, no, not unless I'm forced to require to have got too many things that I've got to uh, take care of and manage, I, that's the last thing I need is something new. So the role of, of government has been huge because they were the willing uh, parties to say, we'll try it. And the uh, first several years of the green building movement with LEED, the, all the projects that were getting certified were governmental buildings, um, universities, other educational institutions. And they took on the kind of R&D component and said, we'll try this out. We'll pay some of the extra cost, you know, the, the dumb tax. We'll pay the dumb tax and go up the learning curve and figure out all the issues and work with USGBC as a partner to streamline this. And then we'll create a lot of case studies and we'll have a lot of actual data and metrics on what the true upfront costs were. We'll have some time under our belt to talk about what the operating cost savings were in water and energy. And then you can take it to the private sector and to the developers and they'll say, 
all right, you've 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 kicked the you know kicked to the tires, and and now uh, now we know how to actually do this. And um, then the development sector started to adopt it, and so the government has been very positive that way, and and and, and starting to. Um, integrate LEED as a requirement for the GSA, for government-owned uh, and operated buildings. And then also, um, in terms of seeing the value of it um, and integrating it into the codes. And so there is this then, as we talked about this, um, balance between building into the codes. There are certain cities that I'll say that are um, anti-development who say, who look at it cynically and say, we're going to adopt LEED platinum standards because we want to make it that much harder for any new development to happen in our city. So a, that's a cynical way that, that LEED or green building can be used by governments. Um, and then there is the positive way in which we're quickly baking Cal green, you know, Cal green into the uh, creating Cal green and baking lead into the code. But the, 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 the challenge will be right right now it's very achievable. It's like kind of a lead silver level of, but if they want to keep pushing it, there comes a point where if title 24, your performance gets so high, you literally do not have the mechanical systems that can achieve the percentage savings that they're requiring. So there has to be a partnership with industry to say, okay, guys, here's where we want to go. Do we actually have the equipment or buildings that can actually get there? And so we want to make sure that the, the government isn't pushing the standards so far that it outpaces the ability of industry to be able to provide these things at a cost that doesn't, you know, again, just layer on the problems we're already having achieving affordable buildings. So uh, mostly friend, but this is where to keep an eye on it and see if, you know, again, it doesn't get pushed to a point where it's beyond the... The, the market's ability to, to furnish um, the materials. So I, at this point, I think I, I want to open it up for audience questions. I'm going to leave some time for that. Uh, we've got a floating mic. Uh, is there any, does anyone have a, a question or, or, uh, or comment for the panel? Hi, thank you. Um, I guess this question is mainly for Michael, but everyone else on the panel. I think there is a growing awareness in the Bay Area that we have a, a pretty big crisis brewing with the lack of affordable housing and what's happening with the split, as you said, with the very wealthy and the folks who might not normally be considered not wealthy, but here in the Valley, it's, it's more of a challenge. My question is, how, how do you guys partner with any nonprofit groups that have this also as their vision, or is that something that has been part of how you do your go about your work? I... Uh, respect greatly the professional nonprofit affordable housing developers like Bridge and Mercy and Midpen, these that have um, produced a tremendous amount of permanently subsidized uh, low-income housing. Um, I'm not here to suggest that our system alone can reach that segment. So I see uh, that segment of the uh, development community being served by our technology because our if we're successful, the benefits of reduced construction costs will flow directly to their bottom line as well. I actually hope that when we get to a point, and we don't know yet if there is going to be a particular hiccup with the California Building Code in our system. We're in this really interesting period right now where I wish I could say definitively we're going to get a certificate of occupancy in our first uh, scale, you know, small scale project. Um, we will likely want to enlist those organizations for the political side of this uh, lovely experience uh, if necessary. Um, I feel, so we see them as natural allies. They don't, in the sense that they're going to be just as well served by lower construction costs than uh, a market rate developer. Um, other than that, I, I also think that the public in California and particularly along the coasts will listen to nonprofit developers. Um, uh, there is a tremendous blockage. Uh, if you show up, uh, uh, you can have the best message, but if you're a developer, you're immediately suspect. And so I think that uh, the mindset in California, if you want to call it an ideology, uh, is willing to listen to those people. So um, you know, the head of Bridge, Midpen, uh, Tenderloin Neighborhood Development Corporation, some of the more respected CBOs, I think they can, they can, uh, their voices might get through in Sacramento or locally uh, more than a, uh, a capitalistic uh, company like ours or um, my former development company, Build. Yeah, so I want to answer that, or take, a, take a step of that too. So I, I, uh, I work for a for-profit developer. Uh, the John Buck Company is doing two large projects in San Francisco right now. We're looking for other opportunities in the Bay Area. Um, and I think this gets back to what Laura was talking about as far as, um, you know, the, the, the 
um, pros and cons of, of government's influence in the development world. Um, and, and, you know, I, I would say government in this case is a, is a frenemy of for-profit developers in the most uh, amoral sense of, the, of, that, of that tone, and that the for-profit development world wouldn't necessarily um, or is reluctant uh, to uh, um, uh, joint venture with the mercies and the bridges of the world, even though they're great organizations and we all support them individually. Um, but having a government come in and say, look, you know, we want, we want an RFQ or an RFP on this particular project and you have to have an affordable component of X and you need to partner with one of, you know, one of these uh, organizations in order to, you know, come into this community and, and hope to have a chance at this project. And I think that's actually a great thing. Because uh, otherwise, if, you're, if it was truly just the, um, you know, the, the stream that was running through all our cities that Michael was talking about, the, the river, that, the, you know, the Agnostic River, the Amoral River, um, it would be, you know, it would be a different, uh, different world with the community speaking out and having that, having their voices represented through the government. I think that's all, that's a that's a fantastic thing that it ends up um, uh, creating a net benefit for the for the, the larger context. Um, I'm just curious. We talked a little bit about Title 24, but I'm curious as you think about what's happening to the Energy Code. We talk about the challenges in labor in construction, and I'm on the retail commercial side, so not seeing this from a multi family perspective, but seeing it as really pricing people out. Mm -hmm. So it isn't just these labor costs, but the fact that, you know, where things are going with these controls mm -hmm. and requirements that you have, um, that to me seems like just as, as big of a challenge. And is that also another really big opportunity for technology to come in and make that more affordable, easier, faster? So curious, every, really everybody's thoughts on that. I mean, absolutely, I think that's Michael, I'm hearing Michael talk about that, that, you know, MEP is going to be on the on the table. How do you, how do you get it? I mean, I'm so curious. You say, get it out of the walls. I'm like, tell me more. You know, how, how do you, how do, you do that? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I actually, um, I have to be very careful around this topic, frankly, because uh, when you, if you I'm going to use the, 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 the horrible D word, when you disrupt a sector, um, people get angry. Mm -hmm. um, and there are certain... Uh, entities that will not like perhaps what we're proposing and other entities that will really like it. Mm -hmm. But here's an important, I'm with, a, I think, a reasonably rational group of people, so I'm just going to throw out something. If, if you're able to radically improve productivity in the construction labor sector, um, I always call it the Crimea River defense. You know, I, there are certain trades that will fight very fiercely to maintain their cartel piece of the way that construction is done. What's so ironic right now is those trades have essentially 0% unemployment. There are projects where we can't even get a bid from those trades. And yet those trades will show up at public bodies and say, this effort to reform or remake construction is going to cost us jobs. And I said, I would love if you had 5% unemployment or even 10%, I, mm -hmm. I might actually feel a little pain for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. But when you don't even bid on our projects, mm -hmm. when your employees are being paid ex really fantastic wages, your markups are four times what they were three years ago, I have a real problem with that, with your defense of a cartelized sector. Mm -hmm. Second, if this is done correctly, the pie grows because a lot, many, many more multifamily, I'll speak to multifamily um, because our system's focused on that first, but many, many more multifamily projects will pencil, more capital will flow into the Bay Area, and although the number of human hours per project will be much lower, the total number of human hours employed will be larger. Mm -hmm. So you're reallocating at labor across more projects. Mm -hmm. Our system does not propose eliminating MEP labor, but it would reallocate MEP labor substantially. You would probably have a far large, smaller share of MEP labor on your standard job than what you have today. And for those of you that are really wonky about this, um, um, the building trades, uh, I have a very close personal relationship with the Northern California Cal uh, Carpenters Council. Um, they pay a phenomenal living, far more than a living wage. They're all in benefits, $75 an hour for a journeyman who does not have a college education. That is a really good salary in the United States. We support that. Uh, plumber, 150 an hour. So if you 
just even do the math right there. It's pretty basic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you imagine no gains in productivity, but just simply reassignment of trades, you can start to see what, what's possible. Mm -hmm. If you add in not just the reassignment of the trades, but a substantial reduction in the hours per unit, mm -hmm. this is, has a huge compounding effect that people don't fully realize in the public. Mm -hmm. And then the nice things to have, the things that I'm a huge fan of, a US Green Building Council for advocating, those things as a percentage of cost end up looking rather minor. Mm -hmm. And then all the operational benefits that we've all, all of us greenies have mm -hmm. um, you know, advocated for years, uh, lower, um, particularly lower um, energy utility costs, I mean, that's an obvious one, mm -hmm. but other benefits, the, the health and wellness, mm -hmm. those things can compound. What is really sad to me is when we sacrifice those things because we have an archaic labor system. Mm -hmm. And that's effectively what's happening in some places. We're not doing the best we could with materials and building systems because we're having to, um, say, cut costs on materials. Mm -hmm. I'll add one thing on the... Um can't speak to the MEP systems as much, but I know I've seen the arc of when there started to be more requirements around um, maximum VOCs in paints or volatile organic compounds. You can only have 30 grams per liter of VOCs in your paints, adhesives, and sealants. You know, first there, the market goes through kind of a disrupt as everyone is trying to change their products to comply with California rules. And same thing when. Um, um, they started banning flame retardants in certain materials. Uh, all of a sudden, there's this period in which you can't get products that meet the rules, and then over in, in a year or two, the whole industry adopts. You're like, well, we don't we, we don't want to have one product that we sell in California, one product. So the, so the benefit is that California does push the whole nation because then a company changes their products so that all, you know they they. Um, will meet the California standards. And I think there's going to be some period of that in which, again, as, you know, as Title 24 ratchets up, there's going to be a point in which we're like, God, you know, our standard um, rooftop package units aren't getting there. Um, what do they need to do to boost it so that they can? And they'll start, the whole rest of the nation will benefit some of like, you know, car standards, other things like that. So I think there will be a period of, um, you know, think you can't find the right product. There's only one choice, and therefore it's really expensive. And then all of a sudden you saw, I mean, you'll see a, many choices that, that you have. Um. Oh, um, oh. howdy. Uh, so, Laura, you touched on this, and uh, just to reframe everything, most of what you guys have been talking about is uh, before buildings are built, and then, Laura, you were saying people design, and then mm -hmm. performance is key. Mm -hmm. So I, I come from an Internet of Things perspective, so I'm mm -hmm. really interested in how are we measuring how buildings are actually used, mm -hmm. utilization, occupancy? Mm -hmm. um, I'm here because I'm interested in innovation in real estate. I'm curious, like, what do you guys see as best practices for understanding after a building gets built, mm -hmm. how do people actually use it? Yep. So it, actually, even in the older versions of LEED, there was a uh, credit called measurement and verification, an optional credit. And a lot of, a lot of people do it because a lot of brain damage. And what it entailed was your energy modeler who predicted how the building should perform comes back like 10 months post occupancy, gathers all of the bills, uh, looks at the, all of the kilowatt hours of usage and all of your water, and, and, and well, actually, this is really just energy. So they look at your, your actual electricity and gas usage, rebuild the model of actual and saying, hey, we actually are performing 25% better than Title 24, or ugh, we're, we're actually hitting 10%, not 20% like we modeled, why? What's wrong? And then that is a wonderful tool to go poke around and see what did a subcontractor not install correctly or what part or piece or component isn't performing as planned. And so that measurement and verification piece um, is, was, is, it, it has been around and um, I believe you're going to start seeing that now. I, there's a lead, lead four is out. And I don't believe it's required yet, but I think lead version 4.1, they're creating this whole new ARC platform or something, I think that's right, this is just being announced, you can look on the USGBC website, that is a, a way to track performance um, and there's going to be much greater um, emphasis placed on how the building's actually performing. But it's tricky, right, because if you've got a requirement to get LEED certified within a certain number of months after your, your certificate of occupancy and you've got to come to the city with that, but this is tracking it 10 months later, how does that build into a requirement to be LEED certified? Um, so 
it's going to be tricky in how that how that um, evolves. But um, other programs like Well that um, you're hearing about also is looking at actual performance metrics. So there's a big push around actually performance, and then technology really supports that because it's going to require um, creating easy tools for building engineers and owners who are not necessarily sa deep savvy energy modelers. You need to make tools that are really easy for owners and users um, to actually track how they're doing and identify um, where problems are. I was just going to say to that, um, what Laura is talking about, uh, for those of you who might be interested, if you look at the Intercontinental Hotel in San Francisco on Howard and Fifth, uh, really smart, enlightened ownership group and a very engaged management group of that hotel. And they are tracking a lot of their energy usage, um, pretty much all of their MEP. I can't remember if it's currently up, but they have a large scale screen that displays all of their energy usage. And they track it, but it's accessible to the public because it's a hotel and these are in the public spaces. So that anyone really could go up and go and take a look. So if you're interested to see how this is done, but I can also say because of work that I've done on the building, those are people who are willing to invest their capital. So the owners are willing to think about it and they see it not just as a good thing to do for the environment, but they see it as a there's a good return on their capital as well. And then you have an incredibly engaged management group, which does take a lot of effort and care and just you know a lot of effort to push that forward. So they're, they're all combining in there together, but you should be able to take a look. And I would just add, our system literally is turning the entirety of the interior of apartment buildings into products. So um, there, there's a bunch of implications to that, which uh, if you're from the Internet of Things, you might already understand a bit. Um, all, of our, all of the buildings that our system ultimately is deployed in will be fully digitally mapped, every single product, location, every SKU. And so that allows for some of what Laura was talking about, it allows for other things. And I want to mention that um, you can't just go into any building very easily and necessarily track how it's performing if it's not set up right from the beginning. For example, if you've got all of your electrical panels, which are a jumble of lighting, plugs, and all jumbled together on certain panels, you, it's very hard to be able to then segregate those loads and figure out exactly how the lighting's performing individually. Um, so you need to meter all these separate uses. So there's some upfront costs to setting up your building to be able to be measured well down the road. And there's, so there's some investment to that. So if you're, you know, it's a lot cheaper to do that as you build a new building. And it sounds like Michael's, you know, system would set up well for that. But just a heads up that, you know, if you have to go spend a ton of money rewiring and uh, segregating your panels in a building, it can be cost prohibitive to be able to do in certain buildings. Sir. Sure. Uh, so my question concerns <clears throat> the cost of Hawkins Act and how it protects um, owners of properties built after 1995, uh, single family and condo owners, and has vacancy deed control. Uh, and for rent control cities, how is how is that act, if it's repealed, going to affect the multifamily industry and the availability of uh, debt and equity to build more housing? I have a, it's going to affect cap rates because. Uh, in fact, it's so funny. I'm looking at one of my students. We had this conversation last Wednesday. We did Costa Hawkins. We talked about hard and soft rent control, and we talked. We had a long conversation about what is a cap rate. And uh, for uh, there's simply, it's very obvious to me that if Costa Hawkins is repealed, and local governments can impose rent control willy-nilly whenever they want, um, the investment community is those who are awake, <laughs> and it will quick rapidly spread. Will recognize that um, there, it won't be upside anymore. And in there's not upside, it's very obvious what happens to cap rates. Cap rates are going to climb, and the amount of capital investment in the multifamily sector will drop. I, I, if someone has another approach that solves that, you know, I always like to say I'd love to know if there's a way to defy gravity, but I don't know of a way to defy gravity. Um, when you cap rental appreciation, when you cap upside, and all you're left with in the development sector is downside. And so, uh, so I'm really curious. I think there's things that could be done to Costa Hawkins that perhaps that mitigate some of the pervert, some of the um, distortions 
by having these artificial lines drawn, but I've, I'm, very, I'm very much worried as an advocate of multifamily housing, of high density transit accessible housing, that um, the, re the repeal of Costa Hawkins, although it will feel good and make people feel like they're doing something, I think it'll actually be putting um, out fire with gasoline. I'm, so I'm actually quite concerned about that. Well, I'd like to continue on that same theme, which is that for the legal reform that you think would be appropriate, uh, how do you see the politics of that unfolding, both ideally and realistically? Um, I'm, a I'm a big pessimist right now, so I don't know if you want to hear what I have to say, because it's not happy. I mean, I, I, we were having a small conversation before this session, and what is so upsetting to somebody like myself, who's worked in the public sector and is passionate about public policy, is how dumbed down the conversations become in the political sphere. And it's impossible, it's nearly impossible to convey to people, even to discuss what a cap rate is. Try doing that at a city council meeting. Um, um, Right, uh, you'll be shouted out of the room as you know an evil capitalist or something. But in all seriousness, if I was king for a day, and if Gavin Newsom wins governor, and you know I'm, I'm I did work for him, I I'm actually optimistic about him as a governor. But I, I he's under pressure to show that he cares about the extraordinary level of displacement that is real. This is happening. <laughs> um, the problem is people want a boogeyman, and the boogeyman is 30 plus years of NIMBY, of uh, of, of excessive regulation and blockage of housing where it should have occurred. It's the fact that this, this the state has not taken housing, the cost of housing production seriously for 30 plus years. That's the boogeyman, but that's a cumulative boogeyman. It's not a real monster right in front of you. The advocates of repealing Costa Hawkins want to kill a monster, right? So um, my personal belief is that there is a ton of potential value uh, in those multifamily projects that have been rent controlled for decades. San Francisco, if you look at what the land values, the property values would be with decontrol, they're immense. And I'm a Henry George fan, I'm a, a Georgist, um, if I'm gonna put a label on myself, and there's a tremendous amount of bound up capital in those buildings. And for those of you that are real rent control wonks, it has a terrible targeting efficiency, it benefits arbitrarily, it, you can have well-paid lawyers that have a rent control unit that now have a home in Marin but keep their rent control unit. I'm not kidding you. And then you can also have that perfect, that the, one, the person you care about, the fixed income senior Latino woman in the mission who raised a bunch of children, got into city college, and it seems really unfair that she could be evicted. The problem is it's arbitrary. It doesn't, it, rent control benefits whoever won the lottery. So my feeling is that if you were doing it smart, you would allow decontrol along with converting a certain number of units to permanent deed-restricted middle-income housing. So you'd make essentially a, a value bargain. You would allow a partial conversion of buildings to full deregulation in exchange for creating a permanent middle-income middle, middle income housing. The owners would win. They would see a, a uptick in value, but the public would win because there would be immediate supply of permanently affordable middle-income housing in markets that have some of the most inaccessible new housing costs like San Francisco. So I, I'm, I'm going for middle road, that's my, does that make sense or? Well, yeah, oh, okay. why, why or how would they become middle income after they decontrol? You decontrol some percentage, the others you record a deed restriction against title just like we do with BMR, with inclusionary housing, a, a, a exact same deed restriction monitored by the mayor's office of housing. And so the exact percentage that gets decontrolled versus that gets the deed restriction is something, if I had a bunch of spreadsheets, I would try to work out with you, but, I, but that, that, that number is the, that's the number you have to figure out. I think that's the politically acceptable exit, um, but I, I don't know if it's the politically realistic one. Yeah. Uh, quick question just about um, the front end of the process. So you're talking about construction costs. Uh, certainly being a challenge with regard to multifamily um, and housing in general in the Bay Area. Um, the upfront process of permitting the planning department, particularly in San Francisco, I mean, it's a problem all over the Bay Area, Berkeley, everywhere. Um, personal experience in San Francisco, trying to renovate my house, three and a half years and nine permits, and I won't even tell you how much they cost. That's a constraint on supply, right? I mean, just, just like, it, 
the patience to deal with that, right? That's one house, let alone you guys trying to build, you know, 100, 200, 300 units in in house in multifamily housing. What can be done? You know, Evan was on a panel earlier this week that I was at. What can be done to just streamline, improve, accelerate that process? Um, probably a question that can't be answered, but I'd love your opinion. Laura had a, Laura had one of the best. I don't know if you're willing to share your Cron building story. You could share a little tragedy. I, I just want to say practically, support Senator Scott Weiner. I, I have never seen anybody take the crisis more seriously. His, 8B, 820, his SB 827 is audacious. It just died in committee. But um, the state has to start really taking, as of right, housing um, permits seriously. Not everywhere, not, you know, not in green fields, not, you know, not in sensitive historic districts, but, um, but there's a smart way to do this. And he's the only legislator I've seen actually address this issue. Yeah. So, I don't know. I don't have, I, I, I agree very much with what Michael was just describing. I would say that the, the irony sometimes is, you know, when I, I my first um, projects out of business school were in Berkeley, and I found that the staff to be incredibly um, bright smart, um, YIMBY, and pro-development, and um, it, was, it was, the, was the NIMBYs, was the neighbors, okay, that really slowed down the process, and I was very um, happy to partner with them, and they were they're actually quite collaborative, because we were doing, or, you know, downtown, lead gold at a time, there were no lead buildings, they were very happy to work with a developer who had their intentions in the right place, and were trying to refresh a tired asset. Um, you know, in San Francisco, I have had um, personally good experience for the most part with staff. What um, is bizarre there is the fact that, at least in Berkeley, you have a design review committee. You go through, you know, eight, eight people, and you might get pounded. But you come out two or three t meetings later, and you've got, um, you've got a decision you can rely on. And, and in San Francisco, there's no such thing. You get held hostage to one human being's whims, and they can come back you know, nine months later and say, here's a whole new set of comments. I was just kind of thinking about it and changed my mind. And, you know, your jaw drops. You've spent $200,000 in design professionals, and you're going, how can this even happen? You know, this is a 250-unit project, and now we need to lower the entire facade to 70 feet and step it back, you know, which is literally what happened. Um, so, you know, one thing is um, clear processes and with decisions you can rely on is a huge part. And then, like you said, it's the, you know, as of, as of right and, and having some um, control over CEQA. Like we, we had a, uh, uh, one of the ugliest buildings in San Francisco where we had a universal neighborhood approval of get this thing down, it's a nuisance, which never happens in San Francisco, really wanting to tear a building down because it's so hideous and such a, a, a nuisance. And we had a, a, a staffer who just decided through CEQA to see if it was an example of um, a paragon of brutalist architecture because brutalism was hitting its 50-year anniversary that year and tied us up for um, six months of study and no number of land use attorneys or anybody could um, tell her to cease and desist. And with that, we passed over the um, change in inclusionary fee structure. So when we bought this project, the inclusionary fees were 12 million and we paid for the land based on that. And then it jumped up to uh, 23 million dollars and we were lucky enough to get grandfathering to bring it to 19. So that added seven million of fees because of this extra study that took us over that time frame. So it's just, you know, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but um, there needs to be some kind of sanity and process because um, with that change in inclusionary fees that everyone's facing and because of the increase in construction costs that kept going as this process extended, the project is no longer affordable as a, a, a market rate condo project and we're evaluating other opportunities that guess what fee they'll provide to the city. Zero. So the city went from being able to have 250 new market rate, you know, apartments or condominiums with uh, $12 million in fee to a use that will provide, you know, zero, maybe some voluntary, we'll, we'll have some voluntary community benefit that we'll do, but for, um, no new market rate and no new affordable. And that's just insane. You know, that's insane. We're trying to provide housing. And, um, and the people and the staff are good people. It's just a very broken process, which can be changed. <laughs> it's 
So we're, we're guys, we're out of time, but I do want to leave it on a slightly positive and constructive <laughs> note. And that is, it really, like, in, in from my experience and to the to the panel that that Michael's just referring to, uh, it really depends on the community and the um, the culture of that community. Uh, you, you know, San Francisco is what it is. It's a it's a it's a state unto itself. But you look at you look at San Jose, Santa Clara, Fremont. Mm -hmm. Like these are great case studies where it can work and it can work really constructively. And you know, it just takes. Um, Take some time and, and some you know steady effort mm -hmm. by both uh, the developer, finance, uh, and and overall community to make to make it happen. Uh, so with that, I really want to thank my panelists for joining us today. Give, give them a big round. Of applause.